SJC 11742, Linda Tinty versus Emigrant Mortgage Company et al. Mr. Barrow, all set when you are. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chief Justice Gantz, Justices. May it please the court. I'm Dick Bauer. With my colleagues, we represent Linda Pinty and Leslie Phillips, who are challenging the foreclosure on their home of more than 30 years. Your Honors, if there are two things that are foundational to foreclosures in Massachusetts, they are, number one, that the foreclosure must be in strict compliance with the terms of the mortgage, and two, a foreclosure can only be done by somebody with authority, in other words, somebody who holds the mortgage and for cases covered by Eaton, as this case is, who also hold the note. In this case, there was not strict compliance with the terms of the mortgage, and there was a dispute of fact regarding whether Emigrant Mortgage Company held either the mortgage or the note at the time of the foreclosure. Strict compliance with the terms of the mortgage or only insofar as the um, statutory scheme deals with the power of sale? Your Honor, the, this court's jurisprudence is strict compliance with the terms of the mortgage. This court dealt in the Schumacher case with a statute, Chapter 244, Section 35A, and there the court had to determine which statutes required strict compliance. And uh, well, it and, didn't, and what didn't it pivot on whether or not the uh, statute was part of the power of sale? It, 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 yes, that's correct, Your Honor, and the the statute. The statutory power of sale treats statutory requirements and mortgage requirements differently. This is chapter 183, section 21. Chapter 183, 21. Yes, that's correct, Justice Botford. Um, and, this, and that statute treats mortgage requirements and statutory <clears throat> requirements differently, as does this court's jurisprudence. But, but what is the difference, functionally, the functionally between section 22 of the mortgage the, and the statute at play in Schumacher. Isn't it to cure, it is, it is a, cure it, a default? It is, Your Honor, but this court has always treated the terms of the mortgage, whether they look to the actual foreclosure or whether they deal with other requirements as requiring strict compliance, and that is in contrast with statutes. And Chapter 183, Section 21 reflects that distinction in this court's jurisprudence. And the policy reason, I would suggest, is simple. The legislature, when it, by statute, demands that parties do something, has to be careful that it's not putting too great a burden on them. But it is no burden on them to ask them to comply with the terms of their own mortgage. So this court actually dealt with exactly this question in the case of Ch Chase. Uh, I was going to say in the case of Foster Hall versus Sales. Foster Hall versus Sales involved a 30-day default notice. I would agree, Justice Lang, that's not part of the actual foreclosure process. But this court said it nonetheless was part of the power of sale. Uh, and that case, in fact, dealt with the question of whether there needed to be prejudice if it had not been complied with. And here's the language of this court in Foster Hall versus Sales. The fact, if it was a fact, that the written notice which by the terms of the power of sale had to be given would not have served any useful purpose is not an answer to the objection that the power was not duly complied with. So this court has treated exactly these kinds of notices as being part of the sale in the mortgage, even though a, an analogous requirement isn't necessarily part of the power of sale if it is merely statutory. But I thought your argument was narrower. I thought you were saying it, it was it's that the uh, Section 21 with the terms of the mortgage is limited to terms of the mortgage that relate to default. Yes. That, that relate to default, this court says, is a term of art, meaning specifically the actual foreclosure process. And 183.21 does not impose that limitation on mortgages. It does impose a different limitation, uh, which is upon default. 
So the appellees have suggested it can't be that every term of the mortgage has to be complied with strictly. What if there was a tax escrow requirement? And we agree. There's no, that would not have to be complied with strictly because that's not one of the terms that applies upon default. But this term is plainly a term that applies upon default. The mortgage says that as well as 183.21 saying it. So if it's a term that applies upon default, then it is part of the statutory power of sale, even if it goes outside of the actual foreclosure process. And what we're talking about here is just the wording differential here? That's what we're talking about? We are talking about the wording differential. We are, we you, are got talking, 90, you got 90 days notice to cure. That's right. Nothing cured. That was that, 2009. How about 2010? Anything cured in 2009? There, there was not. And you are correct, Your Honor. It was, just, it was just the wording. But the wording is a really important wording difference. So it's not merely that there was not strict compliance, but it is that the, this was a difference in wording that made a difference. The mortgage required that the borrowers be given in that notice Quote, it shall further inform the borrower of the right to bring a court action to assert the non-existence of a default or of any other defense of borrower to acceleration and sale. And that, that's page 26 of the record appendix. And that's a really important notice in a non-judicial foreclosure state because there is not normally any kind of judicial proceeding. But the notice that was given to the borrowers by emigrant mortgage company, probably because they are based in New York and so they use the New York language, was, quote, notice is hereby given that you have the right to assert in any lawsuit for foreclosure and sale the <clears throat> non-existence of default, close quote. So your, your client lied, relied on this so, and didn't bring the mortgage current? We don't assert that Ms. Pinty and Ms. Phillips personally relied on it, although I do note that they did bring a lawsuit, but they didn't bring that lawsuit prior to the foreclosure. And when, they, when did they bring the lawsuit? How many years after the notice? Um, I'm trying to get the sequence here. I, I was a little it, confused. It was, it was undoubtedly after the notice. I would have to look. Okay. Uh, I was not trial counsel, and I, I, I would have to look to see the date was, of the complaint. The lawsuit was brought in 2013, was it not? Thank you, Justice Lang. So it was certainly after the notice. And, I, and it may well be that had they gotten notice, as they were, were, should have been, that if they wanted to challenge the foreclosure, they should bring a lawsuit. They might well have brought it before the foreclosure. So but I'm, what happened between 2009 and 2013? Among other things, they filed for bankruptcy several times. They were trying to hold on to the property. They were attempting to negotiate um, reverse mortgage. Um, and ultimately, I'm just were, trying to see how this prejudice them. And, and they I, filed for bankruptcy that, instead, I that's assume. A, that's right. And we are not asserting Justice Cordy that Ms. Pinty and Ms. Phillips were personally prejudiced, prejudiced in here. any way. This is just a... That's, that is correct. The, our point is they had a right to a notice, and there's no reason why emigrant couldn't have sent a proper notice. What would it have taken for them to track the language in the mortgage rather than using incorrect and misleading language? Obviously, it would have taken nothing for them to do it at all, and... So it is in their interest as the borrowers to be given proper notice. It is in the Commonwealth's interest that there be a strict compliance standard so everybody knows whether the foreclosure was valid. And that is what this court has always required. I wanted, if I may, to come can back. I just, can Certainly, I just, Justice um, uh, just, I just want to make sure I understand that your, uh, your argument is uh, unrelated to whether or not um, the notice required in uh, Section 22 of the agreement relates to the power of sale. I, to be strict in my language, Justice Lank, we think everything in paragraph 22 is part of the power of sale. The power of sale in the mortgage are simply the terms that establish the conditions precedent to invoking the statutory power of sale. And, and that is how this court has always treated it. So for example, um, in the earliest cases are not cases that focus strictly on the foreclosure itself. In Smith versus Provin, the mortgage said, within a year after the foreclosure sale, you must file an affidavit of sale, an affidavit of sale with the registry of deeds. That's obviously not any part of the foreclosure process at all. But this court had no trouble saying it's part of the power of sale in the mortgage. It's what the mortgage says you have to do. And therefore, it, when they didn't do it on a timely basis, it invalidated the foreclosure. And that case, I would suggest, 
presents a perfect contrast with statutory requirements, because there is, as this court knows, a statutory requirement of filing an affidavit of sale, and this court has repeatedly said, just because you didn't file the statutory affidavit, that does not invalidate the foreclosure. But when it was in the mortgage, this court said, that's what made the difference. And in fact, in Field versus Gooding, the first case in which this court looked at a statutory affidavit, they said, if you want it in, in the power of sale, you should have put it into the mortgage. You can't complain when they did what the mortgage says, and uh, you then can't complain that there was any problem with the foreclosure. That's a perfect analog, I would suggest, here. The statutory requirement of a right to cure notice under 35A does not invalidate the foreclosure because the legislature limited the statutes that would invalidate a foreclosure to the statutes that focus directly, that are actually part of the foreclosure process itself. But, but this court did not apply such limitation when it was speaking about the terms of the mortgage, and neither does 183.21. It doesn't say comply with the terms of the mortgage that relate to foreclosure by power of sale, which was the language on which this court relied in the Schumacher case. So tell me what happens if you win. If we win, um, then the bank will have to foreclose again, or at least will have to try and foreclose again. <coughs> Obviously, Your Honor, I would then be speculating about exactly what would happen, but I can tell you this is outside the scope of the record. Ms. Pinty and Ms. Phillips um, have been paying use and occupancy every month of $2,000, uh, and they quite likely would be able to come up with some resolution by way of a modification or some other resolution. I, I'm, I'm obviously I'm going outside the scope of the record. Let's, and, let's, let's and assume. I understood your let's question let's you assume. Yeah, I, I don't necessarily want you to do that, but let's assume that the bank had sold at the foreclosure sale to somebody other than the bank. To a, 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 Which is this case. They, they sold it to an investor, okay, Mr. Okay, so, so the investor now is out. Well, the investor now um, <clears throat> has claims against the bank that purported to foreclose and didn't foreclose. It's exactly the situation that this court confronted in the Bevilacqua case. Um, and in fact, in one of the very earliest cases uh, that this court dealt with, the case of Rorty, um, where, again, the defect was outside the foreclosure process. The problem was um, the foreclosing mortgagee was supposed to enter before invoking the power of sale and didn't. This court not only said it invalidated the foreclosure, but it did so as to a third-party purchaser. So what's, what can a third party, if, if you win, what can a third party do to reduce its risk that, that, that what, what happened to the investor here is going to happen to them? What they can do is would be to look at the public records. Here, the mortgage was a public record, and it said in it that the mortgage required a certain notice. The notice that was used was on file at the land court, uh, and so it could easily be looked at and see does it compare, does it comply, or does it not comply? Is that um, something that uh, those title examiners typically would look at? I don't know, frankly, Your Honor, whether title examiners will look at it or not. They certainly ought to. If I were doing a title exam, I would certainly look at that to see whether the mortgage had been complied with. This court's jurisprudence for 150 years says strict compliance with the terms of the mortgage. I don't understand how any title or examiner could not then look at the terms of the mortgage. Well, they, 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 they would have with. to, uh, they would at least have to uh, um, I, I, wouldn't they at least have to get some sort of, of documentation from the, um, the, 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 uh, the, the mortgagee who, was for, who had foreclosed uh, that they had complied with the terms of the mortgage? Because otherwise, where would you find the notice? They certainly ought to, Your Honor, if they don't otherwise have it. In this case, as I said, this notice, it was a public record. It was on file with the land court, and they typically are on file. Uh, it is the document that is in the or, record. Or attached to the affidavit. There's an affidavit that's filed in the land court, and this was attached, and that is typically the case, and this notice says this is the paragraph 22 notice. Now, the paragraph 22 notice, in one of the, in one of the amicus briefs, um, I take it that this is a, a fairly standard document, a fairly standard notice. Yes. And so you've got that in the face of other statutory requirements? You are correct. If, if I'm, answer, if I'm understanding the question correctly, Justice Lang, the, per, the terms of the mortgage are quite standard. This is a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mae mortgage. 
um, and they went through years of negotiation to work out this language as a consumer protection, and it is used across the country in non-judicial foreclosure states. I assume- So I guess that makes me wonder why um, the Emigrant Savings Bank, even if based in New York, which has different kinds of uh, state laws, wouldn't be giving the same kind of notice that the mortgage requires. And, I, and they have never explained that, Your Honor. I've, that's exactly, I think, the critical issue. There's no justification. All they had to do was put the correct language in, and either through carelessness or I don't know what, they put in incorrect language. Okay. But there's no reason to think that banks, as a general matter, are doing that other than emigrant. There certainly are, are other notices that I have seen that are defective, but I think this court should assume generally that banks are doing what the mortgages say, and Emigrant has given no explanation here about why they failed to give the notice that was required. And this court ought not to accept bad notices when good notices are not only required, but could just as easily be given. Can I just ask you one question on the, on the summary judgment issue, that is the who owns the note and the mortgage. Is it your, um, <clears throat> excuse me, is it your position as is taken in one of the amici that um, delivery is not necessary for assignment? The law in Massachusetts, as I understand it, Your Honor, is that it is possible to have an effective assignment without delivery. And this court has said that. Um, and what it looks to is intent. Uh, but because intent then becomes an element, um, it's normally not a matter that ought to be decided at summary judgment. This court's jurisprudence says <coughs> you can't just decide intent. You can't just have one party come in and file an affidavit that says, here was our intent, and then have it be binding um, on everybody. And so normally, when intent is an issue, the appropriate thing is to deny summary judgment and have a trial on that question of intent. All right, thank you. If there are no further questions, thank you, Your Honors. Good afternoon, if it pleases the court, I'm Howard Brown representing Harold Willian, who purchased this property, and with me is Sarah Smeagol. Uh, may it please the court, the, um, this case is completely controlled, in my view, the outcome of this case is controlled by this court's decision in Schumacher, and there is no reason distinction that I can see between the notice requirement of section 35A and the notice requirement of paragraph 22. Except that, except that section 35A is a statute. Yes. And uh, paragraph 22 is a term of a mortgage. And so if I look at <clears throat> chapter 183, section 21, it talks about, um, but upon default and the performance, blah, 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 first complying with the terms of the mortgage and with the statutes relating to the foreclosure of mortgages. So. So, so they are the, the, the 35A and 22 are hitting different parts of that sentence, and they are, they are independent parts of that sentence. They are, they are, Your Honor. Our reading of that section and the lower court's reading of the section, which we believe was correct, is when it says the, the terms of the mortgage, that doesn't mean any old term of the mortgage, uh, regardless. And even now, on appeal for the first time, uh, the borrowers are adopting a more limited version. Below, they argued to the superior court any term of the mortgage. But, but, but isn't, the, uh, isn't the particular notice here, the Section 22 notice, um, isn't it a matter of contract right uh, in the, that lies in the mortgagor? Uh, doesn't the mortgagor have a right to, to receive that particular kind of notice? And if they don't get it, um, then the, this, the, the power of sale and the mortgage was not effective. Well, I would submit to Your Honor that it's, they did get the notice that they were entitled to get. There is a... They got close to the notice they that they were entitled to. They got 95%, 98% of it. It wasn't perfect, but there's nothing in contract law that I'm aware of that requires perfect compliance with a notice. Well, what about... Well, you said earlier that it took them two years to bring their lawsuit. Well, that's kind of related to what was missing from the notice, which is you have a right to bring a lawsuit. Well, Your Honor, I'd say this. The, it, it took them several years to, first what they did, to Justice Cordy's point, the question that he asked, what were they doing during the three years that elapsed between the time notice was given and the time of the foreclosure sale? They filed bankruptcy five times, five times to the point where a judge of the United States Bankruptcy Court 
Uh, Judge Bailey found that they, these borrowers had engaged in a scheme to delay foreclosure. In several, in two of those bankruptcies, they were represented by counsel. So the question, and I think it's interesting, the question that counsel has raised is, well, they might have taken certain other action, okay? Two, two points about that. They took a lot of action. They hired two different lawyers. They were not unaware of their rights. One of these borrowers is, a, is or was a member of the bar of the Commonwealth, and they knew what their legal rights were. They just chose a different path to try to avoid foreclosure. And had there been, and this is, I think, an important point, had there actually been any prejudice, had there been any reliance, had they actually been misled, wouldn't that have been in an affidavit on summary judgment? You need to show that, though. I mean, uh, don't, doesn't the case law regarding compliance with the terms of the mortgage require strict compliance? <coughs> and and um, I, I, I'm not seeing, I mean, Schumacher says, you know, that uh, you have to show something like significant prejudice after the fact if you're going to say that that uh, statute uh, was not complied with. But that's different than the cases regarding terms of the mortgage. And, and I would say that, and this is a critical, critical point. For Schumacher requires a showing of fundamental unfairness, which I would submit is what ought to have to be shown here, because there's no reason distinction between the two types of notices. But to your point, Justice Lank, the, these cases, and I think the, the, it's a critical, critical point. Counsel has argued, and he, he argued in brief, he argued just now, that it's been the law of the Commonwealth for a century and a half, fundamental, that the mortgagee must comply with the terms of the mortgage. That's actually not what the law of the Commonwealth is. And all of these cases and the cases that he cited, and going back to Foster Hall and Adams and Smith versus Proven and Rorty versus Mitchell, and here's the critical point. Every one of those cases, the issue was, did the mortgagee comply with the power of sale? Now, why was it in the mortgage? Well, that's because, as this court pointed out, and I, I don't, I'm not remembering whether it was in Eaton, I think it was, the history of Chapter 183, Section 21, it wasn't passed till 1912. So up until 1912, the power of sale was in the mortgage. That's why when you read these old, older cases from the 19th century, um, and they talk about compliance with the mortgage, they're really talking about compliance with the power of sale, which is no longer in the mortgage. Now the power of sale is in the statutes. Do, do, should we be looking to contract law for um, a failure to comply with the terms of the contract? Uh, is, is substantial performance enough? Well, I submit that it, it, there's, there's no, their argument, that what they would like you to find is that you have to have perfect compliance, strict compliance. Well, that's why I'm asking you, should we look to contract law on this? Well, I, I, I think you have to look, the only area of law that I'm aware of, at least you know, from what we looked at in this case, where you have to have strict compliance is with the power of sale. It's, it's unique in Massachusetts jurisprudence that you have to have strict compliance. And if I may, let me tell you why, it, unless you, the question this court posed was when you have strict compliance with the power of sale, whether a failure to strictly comply with respect to the contractual notice is going to void the foreclosure. And here's why you can't, I, I submit it would be wrong to find that the answer to that question, that it's void, would be yes, uh, would be this. Strict compliance with paragraph 22. Paragraph 22, which we largely 95% complied with, or we, I should say the bank, the, requires certain things, that notice be given, that there be, a, that there be a default, that notice be given, that the notice explain what the default is, explain how it's going to be cured, what you have to do, and it has to happen within a certain period of time. Okay, let's say, hypothetically, that the dollar amount was wrong in the notice, and it was just slightly wrong. So in this case, these borrowers hadn't paid the mortgage for two months, and that amounted to some $2,500. Well, let's say that in this case, the bank had mistakenly said that what they owe is $2,600. Well, there, I guess there wouldn't be strict compliance with the notice. And then we would be in here arguing about, well, they, got a, they were off by $100. And if you think I'm sort of speculating about this, there are lots of cases out there, and I've, I've had cases under 35A. This court Schumacher case, where the tech, the, there's technical noncompliance in Schumacher, 
Okay, the, the, they, for, they didn't identify the originator of the loan. Okay, so there's plenty of potential for there to be slight mistakes in a notice when you're dealing with a high volume of, of mortgages like as these banks have done. But it can't be true, and it shouldn't be true, that that technical noncompliance voids the foreclosure sale. And by the way, how is someone in my client's position, Mr. Williams' position, how would he know whether there was noncompliance? Well, couldn't, what about looking at the uh, land court the, where the notice that was sent and uh, then looking at Section 22, which is a standard term across the country in well, mortgages, and see the difference. Well, I, I, would, I, I would agree that it was possible to do that. That's not been the requirement. That's not how people who examine title in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We have a system for checking title and record title. You don't have to go and look at the soldiers and sailors file. But beyond that, but, but again, I, it, 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 I'm sorry if I may. The, the, the point is that in this case, perhaps the defect might have been visible. But it wouldn't be visible if there was a dollar amount that was different. And, and the upshot, if, if, if the court rules in favor of these borrowers and says strict compliance in the paragraph 22, then you're, there's going to be a lot of situations where there'll be no way for a borrower, for a, a buyer to have the vaguest idea of whether there was compliance. And that's just, it's just fundamentally contrary to the basic principles of real estate law in this, in this commonwealth but, where you can rely on what's at the registry. Yeah, but, but I thought that, that uh and, and this, this is based on memory, but uh, I thought that the conveyancers basically looked, you know, especially if they were foreclosing, um, they would get the, 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 the notice that went out in the newspaper, and they've made darn sure that it was letter for letter, comma for comma, semicolon for semicolon, exactly the same. And that's exa I totally agree, and that's because it's part of the power of sale with which you must have strict compliance. You've always had to have strict compliance. But once you do that, if you have strict compliance, the law of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and Schumacher, I believe, totally stands for this proposition, is that once you have strict compliance with the power of sale, that's it. The mortgage cannot be void after that. So again, that this, what, what's being asked for here is totally uh, contrary to what the law of the Commonwealth is and would create, I, I mean, it would just create, there already is a multitude of litigation about this and it's just gonna make <coughs> it worse. It's gonna be impossible for people like my client to rely client on investor, the records Client investor, does your client live in this, came in this, no, it doesn't, because it hasn't been. Right, he, he, he can't live there. So I, I see my time is up and, and, and counsel, we, we've, had to divide the argument. So if there's no further questions, thank you, Your Honors. Good afternoon, Your Honors, and may it please the court. My name is Michael Robinson. I'm counsel for Emigrant Mortgage Company, Inc. Uh, I just want to echo a couple of things that my brother mentioned. Uh, I believe the uh, uh, one of the most essential points of this case is that this court's jurisprudence has never required strict compliance with the terms of a mortgage that are unrelated to the power of sale. I disagree with my uh, uh, brother's suggestion that the uh, old uh, 1800 cases say that. I don't believe they do. I think a fair reading of them does not suggest that they do. Uh, that holding would be novel in this commonwealth, and I think it's not appropriate in light of what this court has already done in Schumacher. So, so how sloppy are you allowed to be then? Judge, it's really, I think, going to be an issue of the facts of a particular case. And in, in this one, and it's already been alluded to, substantial compliance was clearly in effect with, with regard to the paragraph 22 Well, that's notice. not so, though. I mean, in the sense that we don't, it's, we're not a uh, um, judicial foreclosure state, so the language is misleading. It clearly notified the borrowers of uh, the nature of the default, uh, the manner in which they could cure the default, the deadline that they had to cure the default, the minor discrepancy between the paragraph 22 language uh, and the actual notice itself, I would suggest, uh, should not, in any sense, invalidate this matter, unless you're looking at it from a strict compliance standpoint, which you shouldn't because it is unrelated to the power of sale. Schumacher tells us that 35A uh, provides, that the hallmark is to provide a homeowner with an opportunity to cure the default. Let me ask you a question. If, um, if the um, homeowner had taken a look at Section 22 and given it a close read and said, wait a second, um, I was entitled to a notice that I could go to court. I could bring my own court action. And I'm going to bring a court action, and I'm going to try to um, get an injunction because you didn't send me the proper notice. Don't I win? 
I think she could, I, as Schumacher tells us, I think they could bring an independent equity. But only if they know they can bring it, right? If they know they have the right to do it, that's yeah. right. And I think, again, with, so with 35A, as was pointed out in that decision, you could bring an independent equity action in the Superior Court to enjoin the foreclosure. But, but, but in, the, in the circumstances of that hypothetical, if you were, quote, in substantial compliance, the, the, the mortgagor shouldn't win. And that'll be a fight in the context of that equity action, Judge, as to whether or not it, it's, it's unfair or prejudicial and whether or not they had any, uh, they were in any way prejudiced by the particular discrepancy. In this case, I would suggest that there was no prejudice, and I don't think you've heard from anyone that there was prejudice. Uh, so if there was such a... In that case, you'd always win because you would say the mere fact that they filed suit beforehand shows that there's no prejudice. I mean, Judge, in this case, we're looking at a situation where five separate bankruptcies were filed between the notice uh, uh, and the following three years. Five separate bankruptcies. It's called a scheme to delay emigrant... Right, but is that, is, is that, I mean, I understand that there are, each side can claim issues. Does that relate to the merits here? I mean, it seems as if either one of you is right on the law and whether or not the Pinties are good guys or bad guys doesn't seem to relate very much to who wins, does it? I think, and I think that's a fair point, Judge. And we take the position that it's really a very simple, straightforward issue. Is strict compliance required with all of the terms of the mortgage or aren't they? And in this case, the well, terms about, of the mortgage that are pre-foreclosure, that are not related to the power of sale, are doing exactly the same thing that 35A is doing. Well, I guess. Your argument would be if it's not, doesn't fall into that category, substantial compliance may be enough. But exactly. if there is prejudice, indeed, because of the failure to comply, maybe that's a different case. That's correct, Judge. And it could certainly be raised as a counterclaim in the housing court action, in the, in the post-foreclosure summary process uh, action, in which case you'd be dealing with the same issues that were, we, that were alluded to in Schumacher. It, it, there's no reason to treat this any differently than Chapter 35A. There's no principled reason for separating, separating the two out. Do you have a power to sale? Do you, do you have a power of sale in the absence of a default? No, Judge. And does, is the notice that was required as part of the default provision a condition of default? Is it a condition of the default? It's a condition of, it's a condition of, the, of the contract. I mean, you have to give this notice out under paragraph 22. But it's not part of the power of sale, as this court pointed out very clearly, because they have a right to cure. And if they cure, you're never going to have a foreclosure proceeding. But, but I guess my question is a little bit different. Is the notice that you must give, that you have the right to sue, part and parcel of what you must do in order to exercise a notice of default? You mean the power of sale? Uh, power of sale? In order, in order, in, in order in, to accelerate. In, in, in order for there to, in order for there to, right, in order for there to be the power of sale arising from a default. Yes, Judge. You cannot, you cannot accelerate and go to sale unless you have given the notice ahead of time that the person has the right to cure the default. That's, that's clear. Same as in 35A. Could I just one question? I'm sorry. What, what, why do you have this whole assignment and then you say, well, we, we really don't mean it? I mean, it just doesn't make sense to me. Judge, I can't tell you why uh, uh, Emigrant executed the assignment in the first place. But it seems but not, the, you, not the first or last time. They do this as a practice. I, and I can't comment on what their business practice is in that regard. They are your client. I understand, Judge. But what I can tell you is that the, the facts of this case are very clear that Emigrant held both the note and the mortgage at all relevant times. There was no competent evidence to the contrary. How could there be? I mean, there was no discovery allowed. It was a motion to dismiss. We moved on a motion to dismiss. The, uh, the co-defendant moved for summary judgment, and there was no discovery conducted by either of us, I believe, Judge. But respectfully, the exhibit that was appended to, uh, to the plaintiff's complaint uh, contained, a, contained a document, a QWR response from Emigrant, which specifically said in it that, uh, that at all relevant times they held the note and the mortgage, which directly contradicted the conclusory statements uh, pled on information and belief in the plaintiff's complaint. And I think Judge Hogan was perfectly uh, within her rights in disregarding those allegations. All right, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. All right.